Our final conversation of the morning is, can we govern our way to a more perfect internet? And our moderator is Christine Rosen, who is the senior editor of the always thought-provoking journal, The New Atlantis, where she writes about the social and cultural impact of technology, as well as bioethics and the history of genetics. She's a Schwartz Fellow here at New America, where she's working on her forthcoming book, The Extinction of Experience, and she's an adjunct scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Notice I didn't use the acronym. Thank you. <laughs> well, I want to give a brief introduction to our panel. You've met a few of them already. Um, but to my immediate right is Derek Cogburn. And he, is, he directs the Center for Research on Collaboratories and Technology Enhanced Learning Communities and is Chief Research Director at the School of Information Studies at Syracuse University and also teaches the School of International Studies at American University. Um, Rebecca McKinnon, who a lot of you know and, and I think on whose work many of the questions we're debating today comes from. She's a senior fellow here at the New America Foundation and works on projects that hold technology companies accountable to universally recognized human rights standards. She's written Consent of the Network, a book that I'm sure many of us enjoyed and that I think will provide a good basis for questions. And you have met Jonathan Koppel, and we're glad to have him here today. And in the limited amount of time we have left, um, we've been tasked with, the, with this wonderfully existential question, can we govern our way to a more perfect internet? And so if we could, I'd like to step back a little bit from some of the details of governance that we've been discussing so far and ask each of our panelists to give us um, both a utopian and a dystopian answer to that question. What is your ideal governance structure for the internet and what do you think would be the least ideal structure? Well, I think it's really important that um we think about this particular discussion that's positioned between the uh, IGF in Baku and moving towards the wicket uh, coming up uh, soon. Um, there's a historical perspective that I think, I think Milton probably talked about a little bit, but um, these issues have been debated for a long time. Uh, and the IGF is a continuation of uh, the multi-stakeholder discussions coming out of the World Summit on the Information Society. And the World Summit on the Information Society was an amazing opportunity, uh, even though it was you know, criticized by some people of why even get this group together uh, uh, to focus on these issues. But it was a World Summit looking at bringing together multiple stakeholders. When the UN General Assembly approved the WISIS, it was about bringing multiple stakeholders together to be able to debate and discuss these issues. Internet governance was a critical part of those discussions. And in the first phase of WISIS, when there was no resolution of the internet governance uh, issues, uh, a, a working group on internet governance was formed in the interim between the two WISIS processes. And one of the things that that working group on internet governance asked was, you know, what is internet governance? And many of us in international relations looked at this question and we said that there are lots of theory we can draw on to help us understand global governance and internet governance in particular. So internet governance really should be drawn on a mechanism for developing a set of shared principles, norms, values, decision-making procedures, and enforcement mechanisms around a particular issue area. And I actually find it interesting when some of us are saying, well, why do we even need this governance and so forth? Again, international relations helps us to understand this idea of an anarchy problematique. If we have an issue that is transnational in scope, you know, people are saying, we just want it to work. But that doesn't mean just have it work in the United States. It has to work globally. Uh, it benefits companies and civil society and governments to have this work around the world, not just in the United States. So the fact that just to say, well, it just has to work, well, how does that happen? And what are the mechanisms for facilitating that kind of global uh, dialogue is what we're, really, uh, what we're wrestling with. And so we look at um, the second phase of WISIS that continued, uh, the WIGIG ended up with the definition very similar to international regime theory to answer the question of what is internet governance. And when WISIS ended in 2005, these issues were still not resolved. And, and basically the sort of sh the short version is that we are, we are in what I've called an interregnum between an old governance structure and some kind of new governance structure. So Andrew talked this morning in a very forceful way of challenging the ITU's role. The ITU played a, 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 you know, a central role in the international regime to govern international telecommunications. That is clearly eroding 
for a variety of reasons that go back to the WTO's Agreement on Basic Telecommunications, which pr promoted liberalization and privatization around the world, um, a whole range of other uh, issues that have eroded the ITU's role. I like Milton's discussion this morning about the ITU trying to claw itself back. It is trying to make itself uh, relevant. But if we think about a new regime to govern this period of communications, we have to think about what are the institutions around which that regime will be based. And you know, if not the ITU, where? So is it the IGF? The I IGF promotes a continuation. Uh, so the IGF was given birth after uh, WISIS ended in 2005. We've now had seven IGFs with an eighth plan for next year in uh, Bali. What's interesting about the IGFs is that um, the way they were structured, it was, it was designed not for people to bring their government hats and their private sector hats, but to get all the right multi-stakeholder actors together to try to facilitate a dialogue and a discussion around these issues. And so you have all these workshops, all these um, dynamic coalitions, where there's a requirement of multi-stakeholder participation to try to put ideas on the table. So from a regime theory perspective, the IGFs are in fact can contribute to a sharing of principles and developing a set of principles, norms, and values. And it's not a decision-making uh, venue, although some people would like it to become more of a decision-making venue. Um, but it is a vehicle for promoting these sort of shared principles and values. So, um, and one, one other last point is that um, when we talk about um, where does this happen and how, you know, uh, I forget, somebody mentioned this morning about how expensive it is, maybe it was you, uh, Jonathan, how expensive it is to get to these various decision-making for, and so if you look at WISIS, for example, you know, you had, um, you know, the WISIS itself, which was two days, but you had preparatory conferences and regional conferences and so forth. These are expensive propositions to get involved in global governance, and so that means that uh, developing countries have much more challenges getting to these kinds of meetings. Um, you know, if you look at the World Telecommunications Development Conference I went to in Malta uh, several years ago. Uh, I lived in South Africa and I went on the South African delegation. The U.S. delegation had 87 people and it was a mixed delegation of government, private sector, civil society, academics. The South African delegation was 12 people and the Jamaican delegation was one. Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult proposition, much less how do you get civil society involved in these kinds of meetings? How, who from civil society can afford to go to Geneva and Paris for two weeks at a time negotiating the text of a document? And so remote participation is one of the things that I've promoted for many, many years going back to before WISIS, but how do we enable uh, active participation in these processes? So uh, some way of effective uh, knowledge and capacity development and remote participation in something like an internet governance forum I think is critical to uh, governance of the internet. Okay. Rebecca? Yeah, well we are most certainly in an interregnum period um, and uh, I mean th this is one of the problems is that you know sort of in the pre-internet age we had a basic understanding sort of surround kind of based on sort of the nation state geographical model of how to organize power how to hold it accountable, and so on. But in a globally interconnected world where you're trying to make things work across global networks, make things connect, um, how do you both sort of balance everybody's interests, have representation, and hold power accountable in, in a way that actually works and is fair? And as David was pointing out, we're, we're very far from figuring that out. But I, I want to return to um, sort of a hybrid of what Milton and Andrew were saying earlier about there is no grand solution, I don't think. Uh, and another thing that Andrew was pointing out was, of course, when in these debates about the ITU uh, and the UN's role in internet governance, um, one of the arguments that's made by many developing nations is kind of this equity argument about we represent the people of our nations and our interests are X, Y, and Z, but then when you kind of take that apart, you often re realize that the interests of those governments uh, is not the same as the interests of internet users in those countries or that, it, you know, wh whose interests they're really representing is very unclear. And I think as we saw from Sunil's comments on Skype that, you know, the Indian government uh, really hadn't 
done its homework on sort of who it was representing and what interest is what representing at all uh, in internet governance processes. Um, and so this whole issue of who's representing whom, the problem is is that you don't want people like, you know, Americans like Andrew saying that you, the Brazilian government, are not a, a legitimate representative of the Brazilian internet users' interests doesn't work so well. You've got to have Brazilians saying that. Um, and, and so, again, when you have a situation where it's very difficult for civil society to participate in these debates globally, um, how you empower uh, civil society voices, internet user community voices, uh, to be stronger so that when this argument is made by uh, you know, developing world governments that you, know, you Americans are, you know, don't represent what the rest of the world wants and we represent it, but then you, know, you have civil society voices that can come out more strongly. Um, and some processes are starting. I mean, I think I'm optimistic that over the next five to 10 years, there are movements, um, more coordinated processes that are beginning to happen, um, civil society groups. A, a colleague of mine who could not be here today because he's traveling, Gene Kimmelman, um, represents a, a UK-based organization, Global Partners, here in the US. And Global Partners has been doing a lot of work bringing together civil society organizations from the global south uh, to really build capacity on these issues and strategize about how to have a stronger voice in these processes. And uh, so we are starting to see more awareness. I think in civil society, in, you know, if one can generalize about the global south, which I don't think one really can, but sort of in the non-Western rest of the world, um, you know, people are, in, and I deal a lot with activist organizations um, in, in a lot of different parts of the world through my work with Global Voices, and people are so tied up with fighting day-to-day -day battles about people getting arrested for what they wrote on the internet, you know, um, you know state-level censorship, all kinds of crazy censorship and surveillance laws that are being passed at the nation-state level, and they are so tied up in fighting these, you know, very national-level battles, it's really hard to have the time to get involved with these more global issues or to, to even know who in their government is participating in the international processes. But I think the, the good news is, is that these groups are starting to pay more attention, starting to get more involved, and they're starting to be more kind of foundation money and, 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 and kind of aid money that's, that's going towards supporting greater civil society in, in, uh, involvement from a broader set of countries. So, so that, I think, is, is hopeful that maybe we will see stronger civil society participation. But the, the other issue sort of around governance, is, and I, I really do agree with both Milton and Andrew that there's not one organ, you know, overarching sort of internet governance process to, to deal with all kind of internet related issues and policy around all those issues, that I, I think it, it likely is, if, if we are going to meet kind of two goals, I think, of governance um, on a global scale, um, one is you know, rules that need to be set in order for the internet to work, for people to be able to use the internet, um, and, and you know, the, coordinating the technical coordinating functions to happen, uh, and that these rules are set and, and technical coordination happens in a manner that does not further the abuse of power by either governments or corporations or other group, powerful groups or entities. Uh, and that there's a mechanism to hold that power accountable. But I think with each problem you're trying to solve, um, the way you approach holding power accountable or avoiding abuse is different. You know? So, so it, it makes sense that you would have kind of you know, a particular problem that needs to be solved. Let's say, okay, cybersecurity, right? The, I think we're all pretty much agreed in this room that the answer to cybersecurity problems is not a global surveillance treaty or something like that about you know, among governments. But there is an issue, there's a legitimate issue with security, and there's a legitimate concern about abuse of surveillance. And so, you know, kind of what mechanisms might emerge around that, driven by civil society, hopefully driven, you know, 
less by Washington, but, but, but by people around the world with sort of basic human rights values. Um, it, it is going to be messy. It is going to take a while to work out. But I think there is, you know, coming back to this, my, my previous point, there is, I think, a growing movement of civil society actors, of internet users, of NGOs, who agree that they share common principles on free expression, on basic right to privacy, um, particularly around sort of uh, the, the right uh, to freedom from abusive political surveillance, uh, and that unless these issues are, are dealt with, the internet is going to erode in its value, uh, and that there needs to be some way of pushing back and that a lot of groups are coordinating globally to try and strategy, to strategize both at the national and global level, it's going to take a while, I think, for, again, different processes, looking at different questions, figuring out ho how to hold um, you know, those exercising power over these mechanisms accountable sufficiently. Um, so I, I think uh, Milton and some hybrid of Milton and Andrew's model of, you know, you're going to have focused, I don't think you'd even call them organizations nece necessarily, network processes around management of certain problems and solutions and, and coordination, and that you have enough kind of public awareness globally and enough participation globally to prevent abuse or, or to mitigate against abuse going beyond certain boundaries without consequences, you know, and making sure that there is, is you know, consequence for abuse. Um, and, and that's, I think, where it's going to go, but it's going to be kind of messy and it's, it's not going to be some kind of thing where you can draw a, a clear chart, org chart, you know, with the whole global government's process kind of neatly mapped out. It's, it's we're just going to have to be able to tolerate um, a lot more messiness. Jonathan? So I've got a lot of disjointed thoughts on a lot of this stuff, but so I'll try and be brief and just throw, throw some stuff out there. So I, my interest in internet governance when it was emerging actually led me to look at other types of global governance organizations in a whole bunch of different spheres. And one interesting thing about this conversation is it's, it's a similar conversation that's been had in a lot of other arenas over the last 100, 150 years. Um, and there, and the 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 sort of po the sort of placing of the ITU as a boogeyman is sort of interesting to me. If you want to look at the sort of common conversations about global rulemaking bodies, um, there are three sort of things that everybody says. Um, one global governance organization X is incompetent and ineffectual, and it nobody cares what they say or do. Um, Two, global governance organization X is tyrannical and autocratic um, and is going to rule our lives in ways that we don't want. Um, three, which you could guess, argue is a corollary of two, global governance organization X is profoundly undemocratic, lacking transparency, and doesn't provide opportunities for participation. What's always interested me is if one was true, why would you care about two and three? Um, it sort of, I mean, it sort of reminds me in a way the criticism of, you know, President Obama is this power-mongering, horrible dictator who, by the way, is incompetent and can't get anything done. Well, if he's totally incompetent, then who cares whether he's a, right, what difference does it make? Um, I think that, I think that the, the reality is that many of these global, or, global governance organizations um, are stopped cold when they try to do things that the people, whether they're organizations, whether they're states, whether they're companies, don't want them to do. I'm sure people in this room might remember, I can't remember the year, I think it was in 2004 or 2006, the Universal Postal Union asserted itself as the potential governor of the internet. It was an interesting thing, I think maybe because the name sounds more anachronistic <laughs> um, than the International Telecommunications Union, whatever, people sort of snorted at that and said, yeah, right. And they sort of went away and they, 
they, this went on for a couple months. There was, you know, it was very similar. There were UPU meetings on what an internet governance would look like, and it's not crazy if you think about, you know, that at that time the internet was people focused on email, and so it looked sort of like mail and uh, had the word mail in it. We had little envelope logos on our computer, and so he said, well. Who's to say the universal post unions? But everybody sort of laughed at them and they slunk away and said, <laughs> all right, we're done, with, we're done with the internet. Nobody was terribly afraid of the UPU um, taking over the internet. Um, it's, it's, it, it's interesting to me that this has been placed as a threat. And I, I'm not going to answer this question, but I would pose as a question, who benefits from the framing of the ITU as a threat to uh, take over the internet, I think there are answers to that question, but but I'll, I'll put that I'll put that aside. Um, the question. So let me come back to your question of what what governance of the internet will look like, and I'll I will firmly fall in David's lead and say I'm not going to answer that question. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> However, what I can say is any what I can say is a couple things based on looking at other organizations that that do this. So one of the one of the things that I think is interesting about governance in this transnational space generally is and 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 what and, and I think it's important when we talk about global governance to think what makes global governance different than domestic governance. Um, and it's a sort of interesting question that we that we don't really focus on. To my mind the biggest difference is that in the domestic sphere you basically have no choice but to fall under the powers of the government. It's pretty hard to avoid. Um, now now we tell a story that says, why do I follow the law? Why do I stop at the stop sign? Why do I obey the speed limit? That says, well, it's because the government's legitimate. OK, there's some truth to that. It's also because you don't want to get a ticket. right? It's also because you don't want to end up in jail. There's this coercion that coincides nicely with the legitimacy of the system. It's good. Um, and so we don't much think about what happens if you take away the one without the other. In the international realm, for the most part, and ICANN's an interesting exception to this for reasons I'll get into in one second, just to, um, for the most part, that coercion doesn't exist, right? If you choose not to, if you, country X, individual Y, or, 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 uh, or company Q, choose not to submit to some international order, then you, you don't go to jail, right? So, ISO is some an organization that many people are familiar with. They create standards on all kinds of things. Like so, nobody says you have to make your watch battery conform to ISO standard three six seven four two. The only problem is if you don't, you're not going to sell any watch batteries, right? But you're but you're free in some sense. You're free to ignore the global the global rulemaking regime. What does that mean? It means that if the global rules are not or the system of global rules are not in the interests of the people who are supposed to use those rules, they simply walk away. And so one of, my, one of my feelings about the future of the governance of the internet is that if the constituencies, the users of the internet, and, and we can talk about what that means, in a, I think that's not, a, that in and of itself is not a straightforward term, right? If the people who must adopt the rules produced by whatever global rulemaking entity is out there do not find it in their interest to implement, adopt these rules, then it doesn't matter what organization is creating rules because those rules only matter if people are using them. Right? I realize that's sort of a, that, that, that may be sort of an elliptical way of saying it, but I think it's really important. No organization, whether it's the ITU or anything else, has the ability to force people to adopt their rules. Now, here's what makes ICANN interesting. Right? ICANN's interesting precisely because it's completely different than what I just said. Because, and it has to do with the origin story, right? Because it controlled these servers and controls that sort of metaphorically, people like to call it a phone book or a directory or whatever. If you wanted people to find you on the internet, you had to play by ICANN's rules, period, right? That's really unusual, right, in the global, in the global governance space. And it allows them to, to it al has historically allowed them to do sort of what they want to do, and I agree with David's point, basically the check on ICANN was the US government could st step in. Any other regime, right? So an ITU regime doesn't have that check. It just doesn't. And, and as much as we might sort of fear a global government, there's all kinds of ways that these international organizations are set up 
precisely to stop them from being able to do that. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about the World Customs Union, whatever. Every one of these organizations has a series of what I call safety valves, but you can call them circuit breakers or whatever that allow you to stop bad things from happening. And by bad, I mean things I don't want, right? As an aside, the Seychelles or Lesotho or whatever doesn't have the same power to stop things as China or the United States. So I, I do think, and I don't want to digress too far, I do think the one country, one vote thing is a little bit of a, it's overstated as a threat, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on that. So, so, my, so to answer the question or to sort of wrap, wrap this up, my answer is, it's, and it's maybe sort of a reverse Panglossian in the sense this, no internet governance regime will emerge that is not fundamentally viewed as being in the interests of some set of users and adopters and implementers of rules that people don't, that don't want because that's syllogistically impossible. There's no way to impose such a set of rules unless the people who would adopt them want to adopt them. Right? Now the who is, and there's all kinds of loaded elements to that, right? So I realize that we could parse lots of pieces of that. But I think that that's interesting. Now, will that, will that be more just, will whatever emerges be more just or more representative or all the values that were articulated? Not necessarily, because who, who, the, who, the, who the adopter and implementer of those rules are is not the citizenry, it's not the internet individual users of the world. Right? And that's a, that's, a genuine, that's a genuine problem if your view is that that's where authority ought to be located. But I do, think it's, I do think it's important to sort of look at what other organizations are out there and see what has emerged over time in other spaces before we leap to a conclusion about what is the worst case scenario or what might emerge. Anyway, I'll Okay, well, no, this is very helpful, although none of you took the dystopian route I was hoping for. So in the few minutes we have left, does anyone have a question for the panel that might keep it existential if possible? Mm. Oh, good. Give her the microphone. Thank you for this panel. My name is Laura Lai Kelly. I'm here at Open Technology Institute. Can you hear me on this? Mm -hmm. The question I have um, regards um, the role of the public sector in internet governance, but particularly the role of militaries. And uh, the reason I ask that is that here in the United States, there's been a trend for uh, a lot of foreign policy or global issues to migrate into the Defense Department. Um, and the latest one is uh, critical infrastructure and internet systems. They're, they're going to uh, defend domestic civilian systems. Um, instead of the Department of Homeland Security, and I think it's a capacity issue and a competence issue, um, but I do think it's really problematic. And do you see this trend in other countries? Because I, I guarantee you it's going to be a different set of negotiations and outcomes if the sort of primary actor in governments is in uniform. And I have, I'm having kind of a friendly fight with a lot of my friends in uniform right now. And um, yesterday, I, I put this forward. I said, you know, I actually I have a problem with this as a civil military imbalance. And, and he said this in the context of the dismay over the privatization of a lot of the military's roles. He said, listen, I'd rather have a competent person dedicated to the greater good in uniform doing this kind of work than uh, somebody who's incompetent from, for example, uh, the private sector. And I just thought that was an interesting tension and I don't know if civil society can catch up to the competence that already exists inside governments and particularly uh, in militaries and governments. And I'm wondering, is this a trend that you've seen anywhere else? And is anyone talking about it? Because it's certainly happening here. That's a great question. Who would like to tackle that? <laughs> oh my. Yeah, I mean, the panel. You know, it's, it's really, I, I think you really have to go country by country and really kind of look at, you know, in terms of how infrastructure, you know, like the relationship between the telecommunications ministry and country X and their relation with the, you know, law enforcement versus, you know, military and, and how, how much separation there is between military and law enforcement and, it, you know, and, and you just what kind of system it is and, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to 
generalize, I, I guess. You know, like, so what is the Indian military's involvement in, in internet policy? I have absolutely no idea. Or the Brazilian military's involvement. Uh, I know in China, there's very heavy involvement, and there's been a lot of column mentions written about that. Um, but that's, that's, you know, China is a country that views, kind of like the United States, views the internet as a theater, right, um, of global power struggle going forward and, and has a systematic uh, view uh, about its need to, you know, be active in that theater um, at, on an economic level, on a military level, and you know, so on. Um, but, I mean, I think a lot of countries don't have a coherent strategy at the government level or a lot of coordination going on between different parts of governments. Uh, about what they're doing related to the internet. So they're all kind of, you know, the law enforcement people are doing one thing and, you know, other people are, you know, doing other things kind of, and there isn't a lot of coordination. But I think you pose an interesting question about whether in, you know, whether militaries will uh, become more active um, in this sphere more broadly and uh, is certainly something to be thinking about very hard. And I'll take one part of the second half of what you described. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, more public sector involvement and, and that the expertise, you, you, you said can civil society's knowledge and expertise rise to the level of the public sector. And in, in many countries around the world, the expertise actually sits in civil society and not in the governments. Uh, many of these um, uh, if you look at the, the national level delegations that go to some of the meetings and are uh, debating and negotiating some of these issues, they're stretched out across multiple issue areas. They don't necessarily have deep expertise in the areas that they're negotiating on. And so better involvement of civil society is one of the ways of getting that expertise uh, into the process. Um, I think there's also another element, um, Rebecca, um, uh, uh, that's, that's quite interesting about the importance of a multi-stakeholder environment. In the traditional state-centric uh, negotiating environment, you, you would have the US government going to a, a conference, and you'd have the South African government going to a conference as if there was a coherent whole. They would present a US government perspective. The interesting thing about a, a, a multi-stakeholder environment is at the same conference, you have these sub-national fractures. And so you have different views from the US and from South Africa or from Brazil being raised at the same conference. And I imagine from a, a governmental perspective, that's got to feel a little uh, uncomfortable, perhaps, you know, to have all these alternative perspectives mm -hmm. uh, being raised. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of governments don't want to go to an international meeting and have their civil society people contradict <laughs> publicly what, what they're advocating and oppose On it publicly. Of the, you, know, you know, joining together with civil society groups from other countries right. and opposing what they're government is advocating and, and you know that happens um, you know it's starting to happen increasingly and uh, you know governments have lots of self-interested reasons to prevent that which is you know one of the problems so just uh, just, I just one quick thought first of all I don't think it's a theoretical matter I mean the United States does not view it as a theater they operate mm -hmm. in that theater mm -hmm. I mean the Stuxnet sort of showed that quite clearly and I think there, I'm, there are probably people in this room know this far better than I but many American policy positions relative to what an optimal regulation of the internet should look like, I think reflect a desire to make it possible to do Stuxnet type activities in the, in the years ahead, or at least it's, it's so alleged. I don't, I, I don't actually understand, some of it gets quite technical and I don't, I don't quite get it. So, but, but I think that that's, that's a really good illustration of American values are not necessarily the same as American policy with respect to the Internet. And it's one of the reasons why people are sort of s skeptical that just leaving the internet in the United States' hands, we're all good, um, is precisely for that, precisely for reasons like that. Other questions? Can I make a point about the uh, civil society stuff yes. for a second? So people talk about multi stakeholder participation and so on. In these organizations, I just want to be clear. So, first of all, Derek's point is well taken that. You listen to the cities that we rattle off. Oh, well, we're going to Bali, or did you go to Baku, or you know, we're, oh my, who can participate in these things? I mean, this is not, this is not, you know, Joe Internet user sitting there, you know, in in uh, in Dhaka who says, wow, I really, ha I really would like to participate in the Internet Governance Forum. I think I'll go to Baku or Malta. Um, 
it, it, I mean, you're talking about a very small sampling of the universe that gets to participate through these multi-stakeholder engagement mechanisms. The other thing to say is, I think we can also lose sight of the degree to which different stakeholders participate through these intergovernmental bodies. So I actually was just, as I was sitting, I was looking, at, because I, I mean, I knew it to be true, but I was just curious, if you look at the ITU, they call, most of these organizations have groups that work on particular rules or standards. No, ITU calls their study groups. Look at who participates in the study groups, right? Some of them are government representatives. But the vast majority are corporate representatives. And, 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 and in some cases, there are civil society groups that participate in the study groups, right? So should, we, shouldn't have the, we shouldn't have the picture in our mind. I'm not saying that it's perfect, but we shouldn't have the picture in our mind that when you have an ITU or choose any other UN type organization, that it is government officials only. It's just not how, it's just as, a, as an empirical matter, it's just not how they work. Um, for better or for worse. I mean, I'm not, you, we can say that that should be how they work, but that's not how they work. One, one interesting thing I wanted to, a point I wanted to make as well is if we talk about what institutions can help facilitate this governance regime, if we look at the last, uh, at least since uh, the late, late 1990s, um, look at the role that the ITU has played as a convening power. Um, and, and you can say we're better or worse as a result, but the ITU convened the WISIS. It was because of the ITU that WISIS came about. And we had this you know, multi-year, multi-stakeholder process to discuss a whole range of these issues. Um, look at what's come out of it, which is the IGF Secretariat. The IGF Secretariat has, I think, two paid staff members and maybe a couple of consultants. It's enormously understaffed and, and very small to be able to take on the role that it has. So one thing, if, if, if we don't look at the ITU as a boogeyman, and it is trying to search for a role, rather than killing it and decapitating it, Andrew, and knee kneecapping it, slashing it, <laughs> maybe <laughs> dismembering it, uh, uh, one of the things might be to use the tremendous uh, infrastructure at ITU to become a convening uh, body to help bring the right groups together um, uh, uh, to provide support for the kinds of discussion fora and all the multi-faceted, uh, uh, specific uh, discussion fora that need to take place. I mean, maybe that's a way to sort of promote that as a, as a positive uh, outlook on ITU. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Timothy McGinnis. Some of you may know me as McTim. Hi, Derek. <laughs> uh, I have a couple of pedantic technical Corrections, perhaps. Uh, when you said that ICANN controls these servers, that's just not the case. There are 12 organizations that run the 13 root servers, and there's an intricate system of processes between ICANN and the VeriSign Incorporated. And, and maybe Andrew can tell us about this, because he was working at ICANN when they negotiated this in 2001, and the United States Department of Commerce. So there is a set of checks and balances there. And the other thing that you just said was about, I do understand that the study groups and there are sector members, and I'm a member of some organizations that are sector members. But I'm also working in the technical coordination field. Uh, for example, this week there's a meeting in Khartoum of the African Network Information Center, which is completely open, completely transparent, completely bottom-up, consensus-driven decision-making. And the point about the ITU is it goes part, part way there, but then at, at the end of the day, during the ITRs, it's one government, one vote. So I know which one I clearly prefer. Thank you. So just quickly, I wasn't saying that it controls this in an administrative sense, but it had a gatekeeper, it had a gatekeeper power, which was incredibly potent in the into why people accepted ICANN's authority. Yes I, I, and no. It's not as powerful as many would like to think. Yeah, so just to, uh, just to echo what what McTim was saying, um, the, the, the discussions about ICANN always get really weird to me because there is this, <laughs> this thing that's evident oh, to engineers that's not evident to the outside world. And I don't know, I candidly don't really know how important it is. But from the engineering perspective, it seems really important. And that is that the only significance, the, the only source of ICANN's authority 
truly is that the ISPs that actually deliver packets point their resolvers at one or all of 13 machines that mirror a file originally published by ICANN. And if ICANN blows it, right, does something really dumb, like publishes a file that drops .cn out of it or .tw for some reason, then the ISPs will stop referring to that as the authoritative file and everything kind of goes to hell. There is this incredible value in the uniqueness of naming and uniqueness of number and numbering. And so on the one hand, maybe it's like, well, who cares that they could stop, they never will. So ICANN does in fact have the authority that you attribute, or people might attribute to it as a gatekeeper. But on the other hand, there is this self-corrective function on the internet, which happens, by the way, every time that like a Pakistani ISP, as seems to happen every two or three years, tells the world it's YouTube, and suddenly black holes and shuts down the Pakistani internet because of the vast flood of YouTube queries that start coming to it, because of the way our routing system, trust-based routing system works, well then the internet corrects for it, and the ISPs no longer treat what's coming out of Pakistan as true, and ad filters, and, and so anyway, there is this, I, I, I never really know exactly how to think about that, because there are these inherent self-correcting mechanisms in the distributed, decentralized nature of the internet that actually dramatically diminish ICANN's ability to do something genuinely stupid, so that it's not just the US government's ability to spank ICANN that act as a corrective mechanism. Anyway. Where would you point, where would the ISPs point to, if not to the ICANN, ICANN-informed servers? 11 of the root server operators, just hypothetically speaking, could say, uh, we've agreed amongst ourselves to publish a file, right. and it's going to be this different file, and maybe we're just going to keep publishing this other file until ICANN gets its act together, or somebody else comes along, or we're going to let the ITU do it, or they could do that, and the ISPs would be like, well, well that's an acceptable solution. Our right. DNS infrastructure is configured to point at these machines anyway, and it sounds like they've got their act together. We'll keep doing right. it. So it really comes down to whether you think that's a credible a credible That's why I say I don't know how to think right. about this. It's just that it, there, is, there is this feeling in the engineering world that a lot of the politics dumped on ICANN are overblown because we collectively, when we meet in Khartoum among the Africans or in um, you know, Amsterdam among the Europeans or in Reston, Virginia among the American ISPs, like we talk to each other, we know each other, and we have a mechanism to deal with these breakdowns in whatever it might be, policy, technology, something. It never, it, 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 people say it never happened. It actually does happen that they're constantly correcting for things that get screwed up, it's just that they haven't been correcting for a massive screw up at the top, but they could. I'm gonna take, way in the back here. Milton. Yeah, I, I like the fact that Andrew said he didn't know how to think about this process, but there is a name for it, it's called networked governance. It, yourself, uh, I'm Milton Mueller at uh, Syracuse University. So uh, there, there is a name for it. it it's uh, this process of voluntary linking, delinking, filtering, uh, which collectively uh, does <clears throat> solve an amazing amount of the governance issues on the internet today already, from things like spam and, and routing security, which he mentioned, and uh, even to some extent uh, it, botnets and things like that. Uh, the thing, though, about ICANN, I think Jonathan is right to be somewhat skeptical about how credible the threat of mass defections of I ISPs are, is number one, when you do have uh, an increasingly entrenched and established institution, <clears throat> uh, there is a danger that uh, there will be political pressure on people to, uh, to not point away from the ICANN route. And uh, we might remember that when John Postel tried to organize the root server operators to point away from the VeriSign route. I think he was visited uh, by either Ira Magaziner or the FBI or both, but uh, mm -hmm. something like that did happen and he was suitably intimidated and there was no other talk about diverting the route. So there's a political dimension here that you can't ignore, particularly when so many economic interests uh, uh, have a vested interest in retaining the kind of centralized control that ICANN provides. I think we're going to leave that as the last word. I want to thank our panel today. And Joel, did Joel, did Joel have, do you have one more thing to say? Or are we done? Yeah, just close it up.